seminar, I requested one of my research scholar with whom I am working on his uh, doctoral program. Said that what would be uh, the theme and how are we going to uh, work on it. So we worked together, put it across uh, the issue of hijab and uh, uh, the kima. So I briefly go through it without uh, going through all the procedure of. I think Dr. Pinay has done a good job of welcoming all of you. Feel at home and enjoy the Chennai hospitality. And also, your words will be a great inspiration to many of our coming scholars. And this is going to become a, a great role model uh, for some of our great uh, future uh, that is sitting in this place. So, welcome all of you and a very, very special word of welcome to uh, the members of the executive committee of Caesars. The question is, uh, can religion and scripture be source of justice for Indian Muslim women in the wake of uh, hijab uh, controversy? That's where Dr. Vinay just started with it. We worked on it and uh, I have given to a peer review and especially across uh, our HMI there is a Dharma Ulum, uh, a famous Muslim education place and a theological college actually and not many welcomed it but however I thought uh, we will put it across to you uh, how uh, being an Islamic <coughs> studies specialist how do we uh, really see uh, religion and scripture uh, being a place where we will find justice. So the issue is not just a question of whether a hijab should be permitted within educational premises or it has a, a social, religious and political implications. One of these effects is to polarize the majority and the minority or to construct the narrative of us versus them issue today, just before the elections. But then, since it has come openly, the question that we can ask is what is hijab? It's a piece of cloth, a veil, a headscarf, Muslim women wear, to cover their head, neck and chest to suggest a sense of modesty. <coughs> Contemporary popular Muslim understanding, that is what it is. However, the original semantics advocate otherwise. That's what Faisal Mustafa, uh, who is the Vice Chancellor of the Law University, he will go or even Arif Mumbul Khan, the governor of Kerala, he will also go back to the text, the scripture. So how hijab has come to be associated with Muslim women? Has this appropriation served the advantage of justice to Muslim women? These are the two concerns that we need to explore. Is it really doing justice or is it just a, a, you know, a kind of thing that came along? So understanding the word hijab is a, a thing that we need to look at. It. The term hijab, it is seven times mentioned in the word and the meaning is curtain, separation, or a wall. It's not about the veil. It means that which hides or separates. The text suggests ideas such as barriers between human and divine, between believers and non-believers, or for men folk to stand behind women when talking with women during the Prophet's time. Just like jihad. Many times jihad has been simply understood as a warfare. But then if you go into the real deep meaning, it's a spiritual warfare. It's an inner struggle. It is this dhikar, which is a struggling within yourself. Similarly, hijab is not just a veil that way, but it is a kind of a barrier or a wall uh, between people. So the separation is known as hijab. Nowhere in the text does it appear concerning the Muslim women's dress or mode of clothing. It's not saying that it has to be in this way, the clothing. It's a way. Asma, Labrabeth, or Shamina Ali, they maintain that the Quran does not directly mean hijab as a woman's way, a scarf that covers Muslim women's hand. So, what does the Quran really say about Muslim women's hijab? It's not talking about this, you know, covering your head up in any way on your face. Among the cited reference, Surah 3353 relates hijab with the wives of the prophets. Prophet. And this text has been appropriated by pro hijabists who declare that hijab, which they have been wearing, is obligated in the Quran. That's how they made it. 
So it is crucial to understand the essence of this text concerning Kenya. Is it a way or is it a barrier or is it a kind of a wall or is it a mode of clothing? Hijab as a separation. Again, going back to Surah 3353, it reads, O oh, you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet unless you are permitted for a meal and when you ask anything from them, ask them from behind that party. Behind that party. It's not really talking about that way. So according to Lambert, the hijab mentioned in the text does not suggest a mode of clothing. It is not suggesting a mode of clothing. As the context of the text suggests, it is a call for manners and respect for the privacy of the Prophet and his wives. So therefore, the author Lambert read right that the hijab mentioned in this text neither has anything to do with Islamic female dress nor does it suggest for head covering as many Muslims understand it today. Hijab is understood in the context of the Quran which represents <coughs> Muslim women's separation of public life and private life during the Prophet's time. If hijab does not imply women's scar, as most Muslims have come to acknowledge, how has it become integral part of Muslim society? Because it is only a way it doesn't talk about the mode of clothing. So this can be explained referring to Quranic verses that enjoins Muslim women to wear scar to cover their chest. Scar covering, that is, you will see it in Surah 24, that word it says, tell the believing women to reduce of their vision and guard their private parts and not to expose their adornment except that which appears thereof and to wrap their head covers over their chest. It is called the Kima. Explaining the context of this text, Shamin Ali remarks that in the pre-Islamic era, it was fashionable for women to wear scarves on their head and called as a kibar and then tuck behind the ears, which would then flow down the back. As for the shirt, women of this period were you know, wearing tight waist, which left the breasts exposed. So address this concern, the Prophet called upon the believers to cover their breasts with a scarf to present themselves with the dignity and decency. As it have been observed, the term kimar does not mean hijab. It means scar that covers not only the head but also the women's chest. So how is that the, the, the semantics of kimar came to be associated with hijab? So this brings us to the elementary question on how the scar or the hijab came to be associated with Muslim women and if such appropriation served hermeneutics of justice to Muslim women or not. The appropriation of hijab as a way, according to Lamarat and Ali, is due to the later translation and interpretations. It is not originally hijab is a way and the human is just a scar. So Lamarat describes this as a shift in semantics necessitated by the socio-political factors. So in the process, hijab was imposed on Muslim women to take on a new semantic of Islamic body ethics. As it is noted, this appropriation has social, political and cultural factors. So this issue of conflation of hermeneutics of justice, that comes when we conflict the semantics between kibar and hijab, is now a religious reality, although Quran suggests otherwise. After all, like other religion, Islam is also divine. At the same time, it is manifestly human constructed. The question before us is, if this conflation has served justice, here especially relating to the rights of women, or dehumanize the place of Muslim women in the context of India? The conflation of semantics suggests that human is a sign of social visibility, liberation, and dignity as it was in the days of the Prophet. While hijab suggests human relegation to private life or separation of the Prophet wives from other. The separation is hijab. Should this be interpreted for Muslim women as being screened off, divided, or barred, and separated from society? And this is the paradox of the 
conflation. And this conflation of these semantics has come to mean new Islamic body ethics in the words of Lamar, as we have seen already in the last two slides. In a contemporary India, it appears as though these texts are meant to dictate women's dress, body, sexuality, security, and appearance. So the Kima text was not strictly a text on dress code. It did not insist on specific dressing or dress code, appearance for women like how a woman should cover her face, hands, and her whole body. The main thrust of the text was to cover the chest, to present themselves decently. It may be interpreted as a meaning to conduct oneself decent both inwardly and outwardly. It would amount to a misappropriating the text if the interpretation is reduced to how much skin women should expose. It is in this context the author Lambert with raises the pertinent question if Islamic ethical and moral values of women should be reduced to the page. The popular acceptance of the conflation of this semantics stated about is self-explanatory in so far as the hermeneutic of justice is concerned vis-a-vis -vis the issue of veiling among Muslim women. Should the need arise to redeem these chronic verses based on their proper context and interpretation, the task lies in the hands of religious leaders. <coughs> Redeeming this text would eventually redeem Islam concerning the practice of bailing our children. Failing to do so would leave such a critical religious interpretation in the hands of pseudo-religious leaders and political Opportunities. So the outcome of which is that Indian Muslims in particular and religion in general would stand to lose religion and scripture as source of justice. Anyway, I've given this a small talk to just my neighbor, Darul uh, and they were not happy. They said it is some small of like a Ahale Quran. You know, that's the people of the text. It's not al hadith So you need to combine both literally to the Quranic text and whereas you need to also bring in hadith uh, into your interpretations. And I know it is not going to be welcome. And also I shared it with a few of my colleagues here. Uh, and uh, it was not appreciated at all. So I said, uh, just to uh, you know bring it to the community that uh, how religion and scripture are being used or misused to interpret uh, or can it bring justice or not. Just to make that awareness I gave you this backdrop in this amount of letters. I hope you will not have any questions to ask me because in our speech you should not be asked me questions. <laughs> so I have to stop it. But hopefully uh, this will come as a paper and I will present it to uh, Dr. Vinay later on. Thank you very much. Since it is a Women's International Day and the uh, Henry Martin Institute is proudly uh, you know, saying that we are starting a course on Masters uh, on Gender Equality uh, with the MLCU, which is a UGC program. And I would like to ask the leader, the HOD, uh, Ma'am Srivala, uh, to formally show us what it has been done and inaugurate uh, that particular MA program. And uh, Mr. Ibala is doing a doctoral program in uh, gender justice from Madras University, and this is almost in a commission state. And uh, with all our efforts, that we have started this program, and I think it's a symbolic to uh, inaugurate uh, that particular event from your own hand. 